I would like to remind you that for more Microsoft webcasts, you can go to microsoft.com slash webcast. Thanks again for joining us for today's presentation, A Lap Around HTML5, Meet the Players. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Lindsay Lindstrom. Lindsay, you now have the floor. Great. Thanks, Heather. Well, welcome, everyone, to the first part of our four-part series on HTML5 and all that encompasses. Uh, my name is Lindsay Lindstrom, as you can see on the right. Um, my email address is listed there. It's lindsayr at microsoft.com, along with my blog and my Twitter handle. Uh, another uh, person we have with us is uh, Tara Walker, who is also, and I forgot to put our titles up here, but um, an, also an academic developer evangelist with Microsoft. And uh, she's going to be um, co-hosting this series as well. So she's online and um, will be um, along for the ride as well. So please feel free to contact us should you have any questions um, on what we're talking about here, as well as throughout the series. And uh, yeah, look forward to hearing from you. So again, we're academic evangelists with Microsoft, so that really means that we work with faculty and students on how to implement Microsoft uh, development technologies in their coursework and curriculum and for fun. Uh, so uh, if anybody on the line is a, a student or faculty member, we'd love to hear from you. So today's uh, first webcast, we thought we'd do kind of a lap around the world of HTML5 and, and talk about you know, how it's come to be, who's involved in creating HTML5, uh, where we stand today, and uh, give you some examples of what HTML5 entails. Uh, the second part of our series will focus a bit more on JavaScript and uh, a little bit of CSS. And we thought for our series we'd give it kind of a theme of how to implement some of the HTML5 technologies we're learning, and we'll do so with a game. So our third and fourth part of our series is diving a bit more into that. So the third part of our series will talk about, excuse me, uh, excuse me, I have a bit of a cold, but uh, for our third part of our series, we will dive into the graphics components of HTML5, specifically the canvas element and uh, scalable vector graphics. And then we'll wrap it all up with everything we've learned all together uh, in discussing uh, creating a game with HTML5. So those are the four parts of our series. I hope you stay tuned for those. Uh, the next one will be on Tuesday, the 15th of December, and the next Tuesday and Thursday, or I should say next th uh, Thursday the 15th, and next Tuesday and Thursday. But of course, they're all be, they will all be on demand. All right, so let's get started. Uh, the first slide I have here is to show you a little bit more about uh, kind of what all encompasses what we call HTML5, HTML5, et cetera. HTML5 is the newest, I should say, evolving generation of HTML, Hypertext Markup Language, which is basically the language used to define the web. And uh, the last version of HTML, HTML4, came out, when was it, I guess, early 2000s, and uh, HTML5, uh, it has been in the works since about 2006. And the bodies that implement HTML5 standards are uh, quite varied. So the main player we have in the yellow at the top of our list is the W3C, World Wide Web Consortium. And this is a, a group of people from industry, people from different companies, uh, people who care about uh, web standards, all working together to define what HTML5 uh, stands for in collaboration with some other working groups. We also have ECMA on the um, far right of that yellow slide, and they're working on kind of the scripting side of things. Below that, we do have within these bodies, these standards bodies, we have some working groups that are working on a subset of what all the HTML5 technologies are about. So. Uh, we have the HTML working group, the CSS, Cascading Style Sheets working group, Web Apps working group, Scalable Vector Graphics working group. Uh, you see a little sliver there. If you can't read it, it's the Geolocation working group, and then ECMAScript 262 group. I was working on um, JavaScript and ECMAScript 5, I should say. And then below that, in all our gray, with our little blue one at the end, are all the different specifications that these working groups are working on. So 
all of this is what encompasses what we're calling HTML5. And if you can't, I know it looks like an eye chart, but everything you see here are things from, uh, you know, CSS uh, writing modes, CSS text, to uh, WebSockets API, to DOM, to uh, geolocation APIs, obviously under the one sliver of geolocation. Uh, every, everything that would encompass what we're talking about today. But if you notice, HTML5 um, is that little blue sliver all the way on the left. So HTML5 and the markup there is just one tiny piece of the world that encompasses um, what we kind of all refer to all up as HTML5. So depending on who you ask, it could just mean the markup, or it could mean all of these web standards that we are uh, talking about today. So it's a big, it's a big undertaking, and uh, this group is actually, again, I said started around 2006 working on what HTML5 is, and defining all these specifications and what they mean and how they're actually uh, implemented is a is a big task. And so all of these different specifications are kind of in different stages of uh, development. So if you go to we go to the next slide, we add some color to this chart, and these are the different as, uh, these are the different stages as to which these specifications lie in. Uh, we can see that if they are red, currently, and these this is updated all the time. Like this could already be out of date. This is a very fluid um, document, and it is uh, forever changing because the working groups are working so hard on these specifications. But uh, for example, in the red here, this is kind of the first public working draft. This is take one. It is um, definitely not even close to finalized. It's for the public and for the members of the working groups to add their perspective, change around, and uh, you know work with the other specifications. It's it's very at the very early stages. Um, then it spends some time in working draft mode where it's being constantly edited and added to and refined. From that in blue, it moves on to yellow, which is last call. So we're saying this is pretty close to uh, where we want it to be. This is the last call for any additions and changes need to happen. Finally, the working group uh, puts together, it's a candidate for recommendation in the orangey there. And we can see a few of them are that. And then finally, it moves on to the green light where it is uh, pretty much it's set, pretty much set in stone. It's the final recommendation of the working group for that specification. So we see that there's uh, all kinds of specifications. <laughs> Seems that Lindsay's code is getting the best of her. Um, as she was saying, though, there are all different levels of the working group to progress until the finals that you get to when you have the HTML spec or variations thereof. So it's really when you look at HTML5, all of these things can be considered a part of it. Um, but again, they're all at different stages of being finalized by those working groups. Uh, Lindsay, are you back with us? Actually, it looks like Lindsay's phone line dropped. Um, okay. Just well, we'll continue on, on until uh, she comes back on the line, right? So when you look at all of those standards, as she um, noted, it you know it is going through a series of testing. And Microsoft is no different in participating with the W3C and the ECMA around, um, you know, the standards and making sure Things like IE um, is ready to handle the standards that will be released around HTML5 being led by the W3C and the ECMA. Lindsay, are you back sorry. with us? I'm so sorry about that. My line dropped. I had to dot back in. I'm so sorry. Um, anyway, Tara, what were you just talking about? Oh, you skipped ahead a little bit. Yes, it's I did. Good. <laughs> we finished so, up the, uh, the slide, so you can continue from here. Thank you. Um, so I think Tara was just talking about how different 
uh, browsers stand at different places implementing these different standards. And basically, we all, uh, there are different browsers. These specifications are changing all the time uh, from working draft to completed recommendation. And so uh, different browsers are implementing the specifications at different points. So uh, Microsoft, uh, with Internet Explorer 9, uh, did choose uh, with Internet Explorer 9, which is a version of Internet Explorer that is out and in its you know final stage. It's not in beta. It's the released product. Uh, have chosen to implement some aspects of the specifications that are in recommendation. Most of the ones that are in recommendation at the point where IE was finalized, and then with IE 10, which is in beta, and you can go to IE Test Drive. Dot com to take a look at IE10, though you do need to be running um, Windows 8, the developer preview, at this point to look at IE10. You can see that uh, there's in, they've in, implemented more specifications within IE10. And uh, we chose to do that because if you're a web developer and you are creating sites based on these specifications, as these specifications change, we don't want your code to break. We want you to be able to have confidence in what you're deploying out there on top of Microsoft Explorer. So we are choosing to do stable implementations. Uh, the next step of that is playing around with the specifications that are still in working draft and um, not in full recommendation yet. And we have a site to do that as well, and that is uh, HTML5 Labs. I'll show you that momentarily. So there you can play with the specifications that are being uh, developed currently. So those are the kind of three stages of how Microsoft with Internet Explorer supports uh, these different standards of HTML5 that are currently evolving. Uh, to take a look at how we're testing Internet Explorer against those, I'm sure Sarah was just mentioning this, we have a site here, you can see it on, on your screen, of test suites that Microsoft has contributed to uh, the W3C and ECMA uh, to test these different uh, implementations. And you can submit your own test if you want to. Uh, you can um, see tests submitted by other businesses and other companies and other people um, as they uh, try and work around HTML5. So uh, the cool thing about the site is it's all about interoperability. And it um, includes not only you know the tests that Microsoft's passing with IE, but the ones Microsoft didn't pass, and how uh, we're all working towards supporting the standard uh, that is currently being defined. All right, uh, for the next slide, now we're going to now that you have a little bit of history of where HTML5 is is coming and going. Uh, you know, an interesting thing is if you go to the W3C's website, w3c.org. Uh, there are some, you know, frequently asked questions about HTML5 and where it is. And one, I can't even remember the date now. It's like 2022 or 2035 or something like that. But, you know, it's uh, some one of the um, people involved in creating HTML5 on, on the working groups was saying, you know, it's going to be finished sometime in, you know, 2000. I keep thinking it's 2022 or something. I should have looked up that date. And, and that's because these specifications are going you know, are all over the place. It doesn't mean we can't use websites and um, tools with HTML5, but it's just being uh, defined as, um, in such a way that you know it won't be totally 100% set in stone until a long way away, which is kind of funny. <laughs> Basically, we're always evolving web technology. Okay, so now let's dive a little bit deeper into uh, these components of HTML5. So this is just a simplified version of that first slide we saw with all the um, colors, pretty colors. So we'll dive into uh, this component of HTML5 specifically and talk about some of the markup and some new elements. First of all, we have the HTML5 doc type. Uh, this slide that you see right now is kind of an example of where we, what we see today in a very simplified way, with just a header, bo uh, empty body tags and such, of an HTML4 and below site. So we see we have uh, the stock type, uh, it's H XHTML uh, 1.0 transitional, so XHTML there. 
Uh, it points out to the uh, doc type definition from W3C, and uh, it's a lot of information right there. One thing that we definitely noticed, or not we as Microsoft, but the bodies, the W3C and the working groups noticed was when we when we as web developers implement the doc type, we're just putting something in there because it needs to be put in there. Um, developers weren't thinking, I need to put the proper doc type in, adhere to that um, specific doc type definition as well as use the tools for that and, uh, you know, support it or or what have you. They're just putting it in there because they think, I'm creating a web page, this automatically goes there. So they decided, and uh, just to, why don't we make it just a little bit simpler? Make it just doc type HTML. Another thing is for the XML namespace, pointing out to uh, the XML namespace in this case, uh, with the ending of H X HTML, we decided that's an, another thing which developers are just putting in there because it looks like it's supposed to go in there, but not actually knowing what it is and implementing it. So we remove that too. So you, right now you just see a plain HTML tag. Uh, the other thing is the meta tag of the header. Uh, you see we're uh, defining the content type there in the char set. Well, uh, we can simplify that as well, and we just need to expect the char set. And that's actually pretty important because uh, there's a web, you know, it needs to know the the um, encoding there to be able to define uh, the page and display it correctly, of course. So this is pretty much what an HTML5 web page looks like. Uh, there's one more addition I wanted to add, which is uh, adding the language, um, in this case, English, EN. And that's just so screen readers and uh, SEO uh, can uh, get to this page and understand what is on that page. So that's a pretty simple thing, this uh, HTML uh, website. I'm going to show you a quick example when we do go into the demo in a second. Another new feature or uh, new foundation of HTML5, I should say, are semantic tags. And uh, web designers have kind of done this, or web developers have done this themselves for a long time now, which is try to add meaning to the content of their markup. And doing things by, we have a lot of divs and a lot of spans on our pages, and then adding class names or IDs to add meaning to that. You know, this is the, this div is the header div. This div is the footer div. And uh, we found, we saw that, or everyone knows that you kind of pretty much name your header your header div header and your footer div footer and some other, you know, ones in there. So instead of just putting all these div and span tags, uh, we decided to actually add meaning to the tags themselves. So these tags, their names, express what type of content we have in that. Uh, so now uh, search engine optimization uh, can figure out what exactly this content means uh, also, accessibility uh, readers, uh, things like screen readers, can understand what this content is and then treat it appropriately. So uh, if someone has limited vision, they could use a special browser that could look for the header tag and make sure that screen is e that text is even bigger. Or uh, if there's um, a figure in the on the page, it can choose to zoom in on that so you can see the uh, bigger picture. Uh, yeah, so it just makes reading our page and organizing our page a lot easier. And has um, and lets us add meaning. So this is just a, a common breakdown of the semantics that are using. It doesn't imply anything about the layout. You don't have to lay it out this way. It just is talking about kind of the intent of some of these objects. So we have a header. It's at the top. A footer. It's at the bottom. As, as usual. On the gray, we have a, na a navigation section with NAV and with some uh, A-links to it, and that could link out to, you know, different uh, pages in your site or different parts of your page or whatever you want to navigate. Of course, it doesn't have to do with layout. It doesn't have to be on the left-hand side here. It can be, you know, at the top or anywhere you want to. In the blue, we have an aside, and this is a, a piece of the content that usually complements uh, the main content in your page, you know, that adds uh, comments or uh, links to more information or anything like that. And then for the main content of your page, we have sections and articles. 
You know, Linda, that's a good point. We probably need to make sure we um, really drive home. Again, the the semantic tags are not saying, hey, I'm declaring something as a header. Like, for instance, like an H1 tag typically can declare something as a header, and then it may imply something about the way it looks. For that, mm -hmm. we're going to truly turn to CSS for yes, exactly. the layout and the way it looks. These are just to de determine your intent for what you want this section or this 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 lay this layout to be intent only. Again, you're going to mm -hmm. turn to CSS for the actual layout. Exactly, and so that that brings um, up another little point. You know, typically with HTML, we've had you know with a uh, form below. If we have a H1 header tag, we can only have one H1 tag for the page. You know, and because we're talking about intent here, we can have a H1 tag in a in our header section and an H1 tag in our aside or in our nav or footer because it is denoting maybe you're styling it versus the intent. So really good point, Tara. All right, so let's take a quick look at some of these semantic tags in action. So I'm going to switch over to Visual Studio, which are my desktop, and go over to Visual Studio. Hopefully you should see it. Um, these demos that I'm about to show you are actually live on the web, and you can download them. Uh, in our slide deck, I have links out to them, and I'll point them to you when we get there. But this is all live on the web. You can take a look at every demo that I've done, and I just have the slide up here, uh, as well as download it for Visual Studio. So I have it up in um, Visual Studio, the exact same site that I just had on the page. So here we go. This is just a quick little, you see, this is our typical HTML4 uh, website. That's what we expect. And then HTML5. That's all we need to have an HTML5 site. It just needs the doc type and title and the char set for your meta tags. This is an actual HTML5 site. If I ran it, you wouldn't see anything except the title, but it's still a working, valid site. And one thing you can actually do is take this, and uh, there are a few test HTML5 validators out there, and you can copy it and paste it into an HTML5 validator, and it would work perfectly. Uh, this is a bit more complete. It actually has a body tag uh, and the title tags that um, are empty in this case, but this is a bit more complete HTML5 website. And then taking it up a big notch, we have kind of a full HTML5 website with some markup and some styling. So in this case, we have our in um, CSS on the same page. And let me just scroll down from all of that, but we're defining what our nav, nav element uh, looks like, our different um, unordered list items in that, uh, some different classes and IDs, just scrolling down. Blah, blah, blah. Hold on one second. Let me just get to the content, because we do have a lot of styling here. Um, close your eyes so you don't get um, a headache. But here we go. Okay. So after we've defined all the styling, we have our body tags. Notice we have our header. And in our header, we have um, a flower block with the H1 tags wrapped around it. Uh, we have a navigation section with an unordered list that takes us to different pages in our site. Then we have a section. Uh, with, uh, we've given the ID of intro to let us know that this is the introduction kind of uh, uh, section, is it for the bad, lack of a better word, for our site. And notice that has a header within the section. Uh, we have our standard lovely paragraph tags, and that's the end of that section. Then we have um, a div that, this is a common practice still, that gives us our main content for our page, and a section that defines uh, this is going to be the main, uh, main part of our page. And within that section, we can have articles. In this case, we have an article, which is defined of defined as our blog post. And of course, that has a title, um, some information about it, the body text, a figure semantic tag, which uh, gives you the ability to have a picture as well as a caption using the fig caption tag. And then the last one I want to show you that uh, is pretty new in the semantic markup is, sorry, scrolling down, some more article sections and articles, but there's one more. It is 
Sorry, as I scroll way far down. Well, maybe I missed it. So still blogs, there's the about, oh, there it is, an aside. That's the ending tag of the aside. And in this case, this aside is just giving us the uh, categories and then the archives for our blog. So it's complementing the main content of our page. So it's a pretty standard, simple breakdown. And if we took a look at it by viewing it in the browser, we should see a pretty nice uh, web page. And of course, uh, the content is broken out as we expect it. Here's the aside, and here's the fig caption, or the fig and the fig caption. This is a beautiful flower. The different sections. Here's the comment section, the different articles, and the comment section, and then the footer. So it's a pretty standard layout to our page. All the styling is done in this case with CSS and not in line, uh, not in line, but uh, still on the same page. But it gives you an idea of how our page is broken up into intelligent and semantic uh, sections with meaning. So let me go back to my slides to continue on. Now that we get an idea of what HTML5 is about. <laughs> All right, switching back to my slide. Hopefully you can see that. There you go. Let's talk about some other tags that allow us to interact with our page a little bit more. We have the audio tags and the video tags. So I'll talk about audio really quickly. Uh, it's really simple to add uh, media to our page with HTML5. We have an audio tag and a video tag. In this case, we have audio tag. Uh, we can have some attributes to it that say, in this case, loop the um, audio file. Loop goes through and autoplay it. Notice that the autoplay doesn't have um, a Boolean value or anything like that to denote its its state. So we uh, automatically, with HTML5, take on the default value of that attribute uh, if we don't declare it. Uh, right there. So in this case, autoplay is equal to true by default, and that's why it's there. Then we have our source, and notice the different file types, and so it would, whatever browser that we're using that can understand different file types, as well as uh, codecs, which we'll get into when we talk a little bit more about video, um, are defined there. And that's all we need for an audio tech. Of course, there are additional attributes and stuff that you can, can you work with, but it's just as simple as this. For video, it's, it's kind of the same story, is that we have uh, uh, this video here with a source tag, blah, 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 um, video tag, close tag. It's pretty simple, but we can expand it a little bit further. I hope that slide builds. There we go. And give it some more uh, information. So we have a poster, which allows us to define an image that would show on the screen, on the video when it's not playing, so maybe it's a still from the middle of your video or uh, anything else you want to. You can define controls, so play and pause and all that good stuff. Uh, you can define the loop. We talked about that. Uh, preload, this is important because you want to make sure that you load your video before you play it. Otherwise, uh, you load the page and, and the video is just a blank spot. You want to make sure it's loaded before it shows. Uh, we have the ability to manipulate our playback rate. Uh, this is something that lots of developers have really asked for so that we can speed up and slow down our um, play rate. And then, of course, the size you can define. That's uh, pretty typical. And the sources, just like we saw with uh, the audio tags. And this time, you can also talk about the type um, and even define the codec at this point as well. So one good thing is when HM, about HTML5, that if the browser doesn't support this audio or video tag, it will just ignore it. It's not going to render some kind of error page or anything like that. It just won't do it. So at this point, you would want to define some kind of fallback should the browser that your user is u using not recognize uh, the video tags and such. So I will show you a little bit about that uh, in this demo. So we're back in Visual Studio. Actually, or not yet, but let me close that. 
and close a little bit of these just because I like things clean. And uh, this is just this quick tag, same thing that we had uh, seen already, video tag, close the back of it. Define the properties just like we saw on the slide. Again, you can download this code. That's why it's there. The ability to create, um, make your video full screen is not um, an attribute within the HTML. So this is a, for your first look at how HTML5, the markup, can work with JavaScript to make something uh, function as you, as you, the developer, wants it, wants it. So in this case, we have our body with our video tag. It has a width of 400. Uh, our styling says everything has this padding of um, zero pixels in this case. Then we have a script tag with some JavaScript in it. And we're listening to the resize event on our window. And if our window gets resized, we're going to uh, use the document.query selector to select our video tag and um, change the inner width and height of the pixels to make our video uh, bigger and smaller. So that's how we can use JavaScript and HTML5 together. I'll show you um, that really quick. I like to use the website one because it will um, show the video a little bit better. So hopefully you can see that. Let me just minimize and you can see all my bad pictures. I know this is probably not going to look the best over a live meeting, but hopefully you can kind of see that when I'm resizing the window, the video is getting resized. We also have the ability to create custom controls for our video player. All of this applies, most of this applies to audio as well because um, audio is just another media. Of course, except for the resize because there's no visual element there. But for this custom player, I'm just going to scroll down to the main part of the page, the main body. And you see that we have an input, uh, we set up a bunch of input buttons to manipulate the different uh, controls. Uh, we have a div that's a placeholder and a span that uh, shows us the progress. And then we're using JavaScript to do all that with the controls. So the first thing we have is loading the video. We're getting the progress div, or sorry, the progress span and the uh, placeholder div. And we're creating a video, a video element, this player, and appending it to that uh, placeholder, to that div. And then we're adding the video source and the available codecs. Again, if you were to do the video tag in uh, just straight in HTML, you can add the codecs there. We're adding listener to the events on this player, on this video tag. If the metadata is loaded, if the video can play, it, uh, get some time update on that video. And then we're setting the controls to false because we're defining them themselves. We're looping and setting the preload to auto, which is important so that the video will show up on our page. We're, uh, we're saying once the video can play, I'm going to uh, make sure to uh, log some information about the ready state and the network state. We're uh, keeping track of the time of our video player, so we can see that on the screen, and applying some formatting to that, and then some methods to interact with our controls. Change the speed, so we're changing the playback rate on that video. Uh, to mute or unmute, just playing around with the muted property. And uh, that's about it. So now we can load video, play, and pause. I will show you how we do that, just show you that it is working. Load video, and that makes sure it can play. I'll play the video, and we can see the current time and the speed. Pause. We don't have a stop because we can just play and pause. And we can speed up a little bit, which uh, you might not be able to see so clearly just with the bandwidth over Visual Studio. But you can hopefully see the speed numbers changing below. And mute or unmute which you probably can't hear over Visual Studio either, I mean over live media either. But again, you can go to this website yourself and take a look. 
And then lastly, for falling back, should your browser not understand the video tag element, first it will, um, going down to the body, it would just ignore it. And kind of skipped over to the next section, the next part. In this case, we have um, an on error uh, to show the fallback um, method, which we will get into, or I should say function, which we will get into. If we don't have a video tag, it would ignore the video tag and go into uh, this object tag. So we could use the Silverlight, our Silverlight plugin or Flash plugin to play a Silverlight or Flash video uh, instead. So that's a good way to handle fallback in this case. Now, if we scroll back up to handle the um, error events, we can see we can also do some checking um, on that video or on the browser if it can play the video. So before we go into the fallback, we added a couple of um, of checks here with our with a our good friend the alert. So in this case, we're checking the load function of our window. Uh, then we're checking the video, which is called my video in this case. And we're saying if this if this video is supported. So we do a can play type on the video element. And if it can play type, you understand this video tag, we will find out. Then we have a, a check to see if we can play uh, this MP4 video to make sure the browser supports that. And then we have a check to, on this codec of H264. Uh, so we can do a check on that specific codec. Now I want, um, this is kind of interesting how it actually works out for us. So first of all, we have our video and it's saying, is video supported? And the answer is true. Yes, this is IE9. IE9 supports the video tag. Uh, it is true. So I'll click OK. Then it's going to say, do my second check, is MP4, is this type supported? And it tells me the answer of maybe, uh, which is so much more fun. Uh, maybe, and the reason it's, it's giving me the answer of maybe is that, you know, I know that I, I know that I'm in this browser and that this browser supports uh, this type, but I'm not sure how it supports it. I don't know what codex, I didn't do any checks on codex here, so I don't know if it's going, the browser's saying I don't know if it's going to play, but I know that it supports some level of MP4. The next check it's doing is, is this codec supported, this H264 baseline is supported, gives us an even better answer of probably. Now, if we were to write our own code to do these, um, to do some checks, probably wouldn't be answer, um, satisfied with the answer of maybe or probably. Um, you know, we're used to the, our Boolean values. But uh, these are supported actual answers in HTML5 when you're, um, these are proper results for this query. And the reason in this case for saying this codec is probably supported is because the browser did a check. It says, yes, I can play MP4s. Yes, now I, I know that I have this codec supported, so I probably can play this video. So the device has this installed. However, I have no idea if this device even has a screen. So if it has a, you know, <laughs> it could probably play if there's a screen uh, since the browser does it, but it has no kind of information about that. So probably most likely means yes, but it doesn't have all the information there. So then we can play our video as we're used to with the default controls. Um, I don't have IE8 or anything below installed on this computer, but if I did, you would see this as a Silverlight player versus the HTML5 player. Oops, I should go back to... Okay, back to our slides, um, and if there are questions, I don't see any right now, but uh, Tara is answering them as we go along. So now let's talk about just a brief overview of some of the other elements. We're going to dive into Canvas and scalable vector graphics in our third session of this series, uh, but I just they, they are important players in the HTML5 world. So I wanted to uh, make sure that you uh, saw it. So a canvas is an element on our page, a, a section of our page. Um, and it is bitmap based. So we can draw things in that window, draw pictures. Uh, there is a immediate mode. 
so that when it's drawn, it shows up. Uh, you can use JavaScript to interact with the canvas and the elements in your canvas. And then we have an, a 2D API that you can code against, which allows you to draw these rectangles, paths, and lines, and arcs, and curves, and all that good stuff. Another way to draw on your screen or to interact with some visual elements uh, is the SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics. And this is a vector base, so it allows you to do more some scaling, uh, resizing of your page, uh, and all that good stuff. You can also draw some shapes here with ellipses and paths and circles, um, which is an ellipse, and rectangles, of course, lines and such. Uh, the coolest thing, well, I, coolest is probably the wrong word, but one of the main differences between SVG and Canvas is that you can actually use CSS to uh, work with the elements in the SVG tag. So you can uh, apply uh, CSS to your shapes as well as to your text, uh, even to uh, even do some transforms and such. So I'll run through some uh, demos of these, uh, that, but keeping in mind we're going to dive deeper into this when we do our uh, Canvas and SVG section on um, uh, when is that? Uh, next Tuesday. Hey, Lindsay, real quick, it yeah. should note um, another difference between obviously Canvas and uh, the scalable vector is, you know, in the Canvas, you drive everything through JavaScript. It is really immediate. Once you place yeah. something in, you know, in your Canvas and execute a, a, against it, it comes on the screen, but as far as the browser has no clue how it got there. It, it forgot. It just knows, hey, um, something got executed, and now I'm showing a picture, or now I'm showing something. And that's very different in yeah. SVG, SVG, which is why, right? You can actually go back in the DOM and move associated yeah. objects, and it has it's very object aware, which is why we can also use CSS and work with that in SVG versus Canvas. So just something to make note of when you really determine what's the best one to use. And you can use a combination of both on any screen. Mm -hmm. I think Lindsay is about to show you now. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. No, that, that is definitely um, worth noting. Uh, in this case, we have just our Canvas tags on our screen. I noticed that the only thing in there is that our uh, fallback kind of text that Canvas is not supported. And all that's happening with the Canvas, as Tara mentioned, is being done with the JavaScript uh, in our on our page. So in this case, we're querying um, get, or using a selector to get at our Canvas element and making sure that it is available to us. Uh, but also part of the Canvas, and we'll get into this a little bit again next when we talk about tam Canvas a little bit more, is the context of our Canvas. Uh, we can have 2D context, 3D context, context, depending, you know, of course, what's supported in your browser. In this case, we're checking to see um, if we can get at the 2D context of the canvas. And uh, now we're just creating a simple gradient um, uh, going between white and blue. Uh, we're creating a rectangle, or we're creating a rectangle and filling it, and that's about it. And that's all being drawn with JavaScript into our canvas. So if you ran this, oops, that's the, yeah, basic. Make sure I had the right file open. There we go. It's just a plain old fun uh, gradient. Uh, it's happening at the, you know, from left to right, white to blue. We just drew that. To go a little bit deeper, drawing down again, uh, in my canvas, though I, this time I defined a height and width to it, uh, below my canvas, I have a input button that allows me to save something and an image, and we're using JavaScript to manipulate all those. So first, um, first of all, on my save button, and I'll just jump to this part, is we're from our canvas. We're going to use the to data URL method, which allows us to take the data that's on our or take the whatever is on our canvas again, I don't, you know, what it is, whatever you've drawn to it, and uh, save it out to um, some data. And in this case, we're going to set that to the uh, source of our image below. So we're basically creating a picture of our uh, canvas state. Then we have an event listener on our load method, 
And again, we're capturing the canvas. Uh, we're getting the context, so we're not doing a check on it like we did in the last uh, in the last demo. We're adding an event listener, or we have an event listener to hooking up to the mouse move event. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we're going to draw a path. Um, and as we're moving our mouse mouse around, we're still drawing our path. And that's about it. So if I ran that. I'm so used to saying running because it's not, um, you know. So I'm in this uh, height and width and uh, just moving my mouse around. And uh, there we go. And once I click the Save button, it copied that over to this image. So I'll draw a little bit more, click Save, and there you go. So it allows you to, you know, do whatever you want basically to that canvas and get at that data in a neat little way. You don't only have to draw, you know, pads and some simple, simple information. You can actually draw, in this case, a picture. So uh, we have our canvas, we have a new image, and we're querying the canvas, uh, canvas getting the uh, context 2D, and then we're drawing an image versus a path, and uh, yeah, setting the source. So that's it. If we look at that. Just just shows you how we're building on top of what the canvas can do, and there's the fish. I noticed that the uh, we're getting the canvas and the context in one line here versus separating it out. You can do that. I'll show you this one really quickly with the timer with timers. So you can manipulate the elements on your page with a timer. You can there's a couple of choices: a frame based or time based um, animation. So using a little bit, little bit different. Um, paradigm. So in this case, we're still loading everything. We're loading an image, the fish that we just did. Uh, we have a draw function, one for, which calls either frame frame based and time based. For frame based, basically, we are um, taking the every browser has a frame rate that it's rendering the graphics. So um, you know, 30 frames per second is where it typically goes. But um, it's basically how fast the browser can process the elements, uh, you know, load things and render them out to the screen. So that frame rate can vary. So in this case, based on that frame rate, we are making the fish move across the screen. For draw, um, for time-based, we are going to use the current time. And as we um, uh, go through the ticks of the clock, we are going to uh, move the fish um, up and or down the screen, I should say, and draw. We're basically drawing the image. Of course, we have to clear that image every time we draw it, so that we don't see a trail of fishes. But there's just a couple different ways to do um, some animations. And the reason this you want um, you want to pay attention to this is because when you're doing animations on a page, whether it's in your game or um, on a page or what have you, if you want compatibility within the different browsers. You, um, you probably would want to choose something more time-based because the time is going to behave the same regardless of what browser that you're doing, whereas frame-based animations can vary depending on, um, you know, speed. So in, in our case with IE9, um, and Internet Explorer is uh, hardware accelerated, so it's going a little bit faster. It's, it's pretty kind of awesome, um, but, you know, other browsers that aren't hardware accelerated might have uh, might be a little bit slower. Actually, it will be a little bit slower depending on um, what you're rendering out. For transforms, this is showing us that we can take our context of our canvas and then do some um, transforms to it. So we're translating uh, where the context is and uh, rotating it and then drawing a rectangle on that. So. Uh, this is just going to show us the same shape uh, transformed and uh, translated to different areas, so it creates a pretty little flower. You can even draw video on your canvas. So this is taking uh, the video element and the canvas element, and then using JavaScript to get at that video and the canvas. We're setting the width and the height to the same thing. We're going to call translate on that context. 
and using this trick of the scale to slip the video with that context. So that's this one and negative one. That's the little trick there. We're then going to add a gradient on top of our video. So we're creating a gradient here with a, color, a couple of color stops to, um, to make it go from basically uh, fade in and out from black. Uh, we're going to fill that context with the gradient. We're going to make sure that the video can play. And if the video can play, we're going to draw the image of the video. So we're drawing what the video is and then drawing the rectangle on top of that, so you're layering these elements on your, your, your these, uh, not elements, uh, these effects on your canvas. So if we run that, oh, let me run in the browser because I just didn't get at the right, um, the video, not right there. So we should see here the video playing, and notice below it we have the video itself, a uh, reflection of the video, and um, it's all being done in real time. So I think that's pretty cool. And um, I'll talk about, I have another example of a game, and you can play around with it yourself, but we'll talk more about that when we get into the game development aspect. For scalable vector graphics, in this case, we have an SVG file, and you can see it has an SVG tag. Uh, you know, got some uh, definitions there, and uh, we have a path to define what it is. You know, if you're not opening this in uh, Image Viewer, you have no idea what what it actually is. Maybe you can choose, maybe you can decipher the colors, but uh, it's a .svg file. Uh, in this case, we're using it as the source to our image tag. For XHTML, this is how we would uh, do it. So we have our body tags and our SVG element. And uh, here we go uh, in HTML5. So in our body, we have this SVG element. We give it um, set to the fill value, or we, c we could set it to the, um, the SVG element that we already have. So it's a pretty easy, easy thing to do. Now, uh, we can even add styling to our scalable vector graphics uh, with CSS. So in this case, we have um, our SVG. Uh, it's a circle. And then, um, yeah, make sure I didn't show anything. Uh, we also have a div with a class of um, of box. And in our styling, we can style the box. We're, you know, we're used to seeing a div with a class there and adding some styling to it. In this case, we're setting the background property to this SVG. Now we have a circle below it, and we can um, add some CSS to its stroke and fill colors. If I ran that one, you should see some context here. Um, the SVG is not loading because I don't. I didn't have that in the same uh, directory. I don't know why I did that. Oops, I lost my page. Um, Again, you'll get these links, the SVG, the styling. There we go. So it's showing me my SVG, and then the circle, which has some styling applied to it. Uh, we can also work with uh, gradients. And uh, I think I'll and apply some styling to the gradient if you want to. In this case, we just have an input button to do something using JavaScript. Excuse me. We're using JavaScript. On the load function, we're creating a colors array, uh, adding yellow and red, creating an SVG uh, using those colors. Uh, this is pretty cool. We're actually using um, encoding. Uh, this is a little bit complex, but we're going to make this SVG element, this .svg file, um, by encoding it, and then applying the CSS to uh, our gradient ID. So we're saying the, the background URL is to this new SVG that we created. It's kind of a similar thing that we did um, a couple of uh, demos ago. So the background 
CSS styling is to this gradient, which we just created. Uh, the, uh, sorry, this SVG that we just created. And then we create the, uh, this gradient on this SVG, adding the stop color, and for each stop color, um, to find that rectangle. So if you ran that one, you should see it's a button. It's an input button, if you remember our uh, HTML. And it uh, has our gradients, this yellow, orange, and red at different points. And so this is pretty cool. You don't have to create images or buttons um, that look different, pasting in uh, images of the background. You can do this all in code and styling. So I'm running a little bit, I'm oh, running um, a lot behind. So let me go back to my, yep, I do. Thanks, Tara. <laughs> um, there we go. Um, we're close to the end. And... I will talk a bit more about this in our next session with JavaScript, but I did mention briefly that IE9 has the ability to uh, do hardware acceleration. And um, yeah, so GPUs are commonplace now uh, versus using just the uh, CPU to render things to our screens. Uh, GPUs now are on pretty much every modern computer and allow us to uh, help render our text, video, and other media elements to the screen. And now in modern computers, of course, we have multiple cores. And uh, yeah, so now with uh, Internet Explorer 9 and above, we are going to use hardware acceleration where we combine the GPU power and the CPU power to render the elements on our screen. And uh, this allows us to uh, run our JavaScript more efficiently and quickly as well as, of course, load our images and render them to the screen. So a good idea to test that in Internet Explorer is if you go to beautyoftheweb.com, and you can do a few little tests there. I would show you, but we're running out of time. And um, if you just, I'll show you the links at the end, and you can go there yourself. Uh, uh, this is kind of the architecture, a little bit of uh, background of how it works. Um, but basically, you get the benefits of having those multiple cores and getting um, the pages get faster because you can, um, in the background, uh, get that uh, down to native code, pass the information back up to the browser, and have it rendered to the screen. Uh, this is just a little quick uh, example of an animation in IE. So in IE8, uh, this is kind of uh, how much power uh, it was taking, and in IE9, uh, that CPU runs way down because we have the GPU um, to handle our hardware acceleration. Uh, we'll talk about this more in the next thing. I just want to give you a little quick thing, but ECMAScript 5 um, is now available. So, or I should say JavaScript, ECMA 5, um, allows us to, uh, this newer version of JavaScript, as we defined in our standards body at the top, we have the ability to get add event listeners so we can plug it to our events. We can get our element by class names. We have, uh, there's no, uh, JavaScript is not an object-oriented language, so we have some new methods and such that we can kind of uh, build our own um, objects around or kind of treat it a little bit more like an object. Like uh, instead of using, you know, create a prototype, we can define actual properties um, and uh, get at our prototype, get prototype of. Uh, we even have some methods that we know and love in object-oriented languages but we can use on um, JavaScript, such as trimming a string. I'm not sure if her, uh, her phone uh, dropped again. Um, but since we're quickly running out of time, I want you guys all on this call to, there was a link that I placed in the Q&A that you guys could check out. 
it is also a way to show how you could use Canvas, um, CSS, and SVG, as well as other HTML5 based tags in one page. And what that gives you is the ability to use the most appropriate tag and or object for what you need for your page. You're not constrained in order to have to do one versus the other. So I wanted to make sure, you know, you guys also, you know, knew that. Um, <clears throat> so let's uh, go on to um, the next slide. All right. So what we've shown you uh, here is, okay, it's moving a little faster than I wanted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what we've talked about here is some of the base differences of what you get with HTML5. Uh, we've talked about Canvas. Uh, we've talked about, you know, some of the HTML5 markups, the semantic tags, and, the, again, the HTML5 diffs. We didn't get the polygot markup, but we will talk about that a little bit in the next section. What I would love for you all to join us in the next um, webcast where we get and really delve into JavaScript. And leveraging JavaScript with all these great new features that HTML5 and the associated tags are coming up with. Um, and with that, are there any more questions that I can answer? I see one. And he said, is the link working for anyone else? Um, the link should work. Make sure you get the whole thing. Um, if not, please let me know. You can also go to Beauty of the Web. This link is also there. And again, it will show you um, the HTML5 Blizzard using Canvas, C um, SVG, and CSS together with some other HTML5 tags and how the Hotwell acceleration really helps to drive the experience home. So I see that... Um, Thank you, Eric. I, when I pasted it, there's a extra space there before HTML5. Sorry. So if you take that space out, you guys should have no problems in getting to that site to be able to see those examples. And it goes into a bit of detail, luckily, um, around how you can leverage each of the differences. Okay? And with that, I hope you guys enjoy yes. Okay, and it looks like Lindsay rejoined us again. Yeah, my computer is completely frozen. I had to join on another thing. <laughs> I don't know what's happened. So, Tara, I, um, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I, I think Tara just finished it up. Again, I have, I can't see. I'm not in the meeting. Um, so, join us. We're pretty much at the end anyway. So, join us for Thursdays on JavaScript. We'll go more into ECMAScript 5 and new JavaScript, as well as uh, CSS, and uh, more on that later. So thank you for joining. Sorry about the technical difficulty, difficulties. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday and then next week for Part 3 and 4. Okay. Thank you so much, Lindsay and Tara, for your presentation today. Ladies and gentlemen, before you log off, we would greatly appreciate if you can take just a moment to fill out our survey for today's event. You should be seeing that showing up in your slide area now. And all you need to do is click on the appropriate link uh, in order to fill out the survey. And with that, I would like to thank everyone for joining us. And you may now disconnect from the audio portion of the event.